So good evening, everyone, and welcome to our MTSA Pupilage Panel event. We are super excited to have such a broad audience this evening, ranging from barristers, law students, and prospective law students. Tonight's panel is absolutely outstanding, and we look forward to hearing from Stephen Pauls QC from Doughty Street Chambers, Christopher Boardman QC from Radcliffe Chambers, Karma Melly QC from Park Square Barristers, and Georgina Wolf from Five Essex Court. Between them, they cover a range of areas in law, from criminal, international crime, commercial, human rights, inquests, so we are in for a treat. But before we get started, I would like to go over three points. Point number one, if you have any questions, please feel free to message me directly and we will try to get those questions answered by our awesome panel. At the end of the event, if time allows for it, what we will do is have you raise your digital Zoom hand and then we'll call upon you to speak. Two, if you can please keep yourself on mute at all times, that will be really helpful as this event is being recorded and we hope to eventually upload it onto our YouTube channel, which is my last point. So without further delay, I am super happy to pass you over to your host this evening. And they are Caitlin Nuez, who is our communications officer and Samuel Osu Osa, who is our vice president. Uh, hello. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, uh, great panel. Thank you, uh, Victoria. Uh, just like the president said, we are very honored to have this awesome panel to dedicate their time to have this wonderful discussion with us. So uh, I think we'll allow the panel to introduce themselves to us. And uh, so if we can start with uh, Stephen Pauls, yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Samuel, and, and thank you to, to you, Caitlin, and to Victoria for the very uh, kind invitation to speak this evening at the Middle Temple Students Association uh, pupillage uh, uh, event. Um, as uh, Victoria said in a very warm and, and kind introduction, I'm a barrister at Doughty Street Chambers, where I've been since 2001. Um, I specialise in crime, but predominantly international crime um, in, in the Hague and at international criminal tribunals around the world. Um, Doughty Street Chambers, I think, was the first, one of, if not the first, chambers to open up an office in the Hague, where most of the international criminal courts are. And, and pretty much since pupillage, I've been going back and forth to the Hague to conduct proceedings there and at the other international tribunals around the world in Sierra Leone and, 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 and other, other jurisdictions as well. Um, I guess what might be helpful is to give some background in terms of how I got to the bar, um, but perhaps before doing that, just if I can highlight three, what I think are really important points. Uh, the, the, the first one is to, is to really encourage you all to have, have belief and confidence that you will get there in the end. It can seem incredibly daunting uh, especially when you're starting out in, in, in your career. Um, and, and it can seem incredibly challenging, but it, 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 if there's one thing I can impress upon you, if you keep trying and you keep persevering, there is a really good chance that you will get there in the end um, to, to the place that you want to be. Uh, the, the, the second thing is, is that there are a huge number of people out there who really want to help you. I mean, we're all independent practitioners, but you know, we've all along the way had enormous help from those ahead of us in the profession over the years, and they in turn have been helped by people before them. And as a result of all of that, there's a huge um, buildup of goodwill in the profession. We all want to share that with the next generation um, coming along. So don't ever hesitate to reach out to people that you think might be able to help you, ask them questions and, and, and just put things to them and see what they may or may not be able to do for you. Everyone wants to help you if, if they can. And the third thing is, is when you're filling in your applications or thinking about what you want to do is make sure it's evidence-based. Um, 
it's really important to, to back up everything you say and all the interests that you say you have with evidence that you've actually done it and have some proof um, that you've got interest in that area or, 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 or some experience in that particular area. So with those sort of three general points, um, perhaps I'll say a little bit about how I got to, to be at the bar. Um, I think it's really important, perhaps now more than ever, to have as diverse a bar as we can possibly have. I, I was brought up by a single parent, an, an un-English single parent. I went to state school, free school meals, all the rest of it. Went and from there to, 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 to university, did law, did a master's, and then, then, then was lucky enough to get into chambers. But as I say, it's, it's, the, the makeup of the profession is really important that we have as many people from as many different varied backgrounds as, as possible. At the end of the day, the bar really does need to reflect the diverse society that we all come from, um, if it's to give uh, confidence to the people that we're there to serve and the people that we're there to represent um, in, in what will almost certainly be the, the most difficult or one of the most difficult experiences that they're going to have when, when they're going through litigation or going to court. So uh, you know, don't think that you're not from the right background to come to the bar. Everyone's from the right background to come to the bar. We need as many different went on to do a, a master's at LS, at, at undergraduate degree at LSE and then went on to do a, a master's and, and as I said at the beginning it's really important to try and back up your um, CV with as much evidence as you possibly can of your interests so while I was going through university um, as well as specializing in the areas of law that I really wanted to go into I took every opportunity I could possibly get to get experience in areas of law that I might want to go into but also got experience in things that um, I you know, potentially had no interest in, which in my case was really useful because uh, certainly two of the, the, the bits of work experience I had, uh, one with, with a criminal firm at that time, I had no interest in doing crime whatsoever. But someone came to university, gave a talk about criminal law, and it was a criminal solicitor, said anyone who wants to have some experience, you, you're welcome to come. I did that and within a few days I knew that criminal law was what I wanted to go into. So don't rule anything out, try and get as much um, diverse experience as, as you possibly uh, can. Um, I ended up specialising in international criminal law, I think it was while I was at bar school that um, I, I got my first taste for international criminal law. I bunked off one day and went over to The Hague to watch some of the proceedings at what was then the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. I, I found it fascinating. It was a, a, a court with judges and lawyers from all over the world. There, were, there was a, 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 an, an, an American Texan lawyer complaining that the court wasn't applying the Texan criminal code. There was a, 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 an Italian lawyer gesticulating, <laughs> getting very excited. There was a German lawyer insisting that the, that, that the court must stick to the rules. There was an English lawyer wearing a, a wig, the only lawyer in court wearing a wig. Um, his client later went on to, 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 to refuse to be represented by them, saying that he, he didn't want to be represented by someone who was wearing a bird's nest uh, on his head. Um, so it's, a, it, it, it is an amazing thing to see. There were judges from all over the world. There was a, a Kenyan judge, a Pakistani judge, a Costa Rican judge. Um, one of the judges, unfortunately, had the nasty habit of um, falling asleep. In, in the middle of, of, of proceedings, which led to one of the defendants to complain that he hadn't had a fair trial because the judge was asleep throughout the proceedings. Um, when he was convicted, he appealed later and said he hadn't had a fair trial because the judge was asleep. The appeals chamber consider, considered the point and said that the judge hadn't been asleep, they just hadn't been fully conscious uh, for certain portions of the trial and on that basis uh, upheld his conviction. I, I found all of that fascinating while I was watching it and, and and that's what really motivated me and drove me to get into international criminal law. So all of that to say get as much experience as you possibly can because you never know what is going to um, uh, excite your interest and where you'll end up working. So the, the, the more that you can do the more that, um, uh, uh, the, 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 that you'll be in a position to make an informed choice in, in due course. I, I had a, 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 a quite a so, so, a long and convoluted route to, to where I ended up at Doughty Street Chambers. Um, I was rejected by Doughty Street for pupillage, um, so don't be disheartened by rejections in early days. Um, I think most people will, will move around from one chambers to the other. I did three pupillages in the end, a garden court uh, in a criminal set, three Roman buildings doing crime and then cloisters, and then eventually ended up at, at Doughty Street a, a long way down, down the line. If you don't get what you want first time round, 
keep trying and trying again. If you don't get pupillage first time around, get experience in a, in a, in a different area, you know, perhaps be a sister advocate, be, be a paralegal, get experience in something else. It's all good experience and will help you uh, when you finally do uh, make it to the bar and come to the bar. All experience is good experience. So embrace it all. Um, with that, I wish you all the very best. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, that was such a detailed introduction um, with all of the advice kind of weaved into it. But um, thank you so much. I'm sure we'll find out more of your advice and insight as we go on. Uh, I'll move next to Christopher. Do you want to introduce yourself and tell us about your journey? Indeed. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Boardman. I am a barrister practicing in corporate and commercial law from Radcliffe Chambers in Lincoln's Inn. Um, we barristers from Chancery Chambers um, probably have a bad reputation in terms of uh, our standoffishness, um, the approach that we take, and the fact that we're not really all that attractive as Chambers to, to many students coming in. I can't match the entertaining stories that you've just heard from, from Stephen about the International Criminal Courts because we're really at the business end of matters at the Chancery Division, and that's the sort of thing that I specialise in. And my story really starts from uh, school, leaving school without a clue what I really wanted to do. Uh, unlike many of my friends at the time who seemed to be very sorted and organised and had organised everything to do with the university and the, the subjects, and I, I'd sort of gone along with them and applied to do economics because I couldn't think of anything else to do. I was the first person to go to university in my, in my family. Um, and I didn't have anyone to sort of draw on to sort of advise me. And I seem to remember that the, well, in those days, I'm talking in the mid nineties, the school, um, you know, advice to people for occupations was pretty much non-existent. Uh, you either knew what you wanted to do or you didn't, and I had no idea. So after about 18 months traveling around Italy, um, I decided it was time to come home and do something sensible. And it came to me one day, I know this sounds ridiculous because it, it is, but it happens to be true. Um, I, was, I was actually uh, sitting overlooking um, a, a church in Umbria uh, uh, and thinking, what on earth am I going to do? And it suddenly came to me, I'd like to be a barrister. But where it came from, I've got no idea because I didn't know any barristers. Um, I had no experience of the law or anything, but it came to me. And when I got back uh, to England, which was uh, a couple of months afterwards, I started looking into it. And I then started working because I needed money. Um, and I started working as a broker in the city. And I, I came across the sort of idea that I would actually study part time rather because I needed to, to fund myself. And so what I did was I enrolled with London University I, on a part time course as an external student. I did my degree in law over three years, studying um, in the evenings and at weekends and during holiday times, not that I had any at that point. And um, I, after three years, I then decided I'd like to do uh, a master's degree. And the reason I did that was purely because somebody told me that, you know, I'd have absolutely no chance of going and becoming a barrister at, uh, in, co in commercial chancery chambers unless I had a, a master's degree. So I did that. And I knew, um, given the kind of work that I was doing, which is broking financial instruments, that I was interested in, um, you know, commercial type law. And when I uh, was doing my studies, I discovered that I liked things like company law, insolvency law, international finance, that sort of thing. So that's what I did a specialist LLM in um, at the Centre for Commercial Law. I then went to bar school um, and I had to sort of straggle um, giving up full time work with, you know, doing a bit more studying and, and doing part time work. It, was, it, was, it wasn't easy, uh, but, I, but I managed that. Uh, and then lo and behold, much to my surprise, after a lot of work, I got myself a pupillage. Um, it took quite a few applications, quite a lot of interviews. Uh, we can um, regale you with those sorts of stories, let, no doubt, later on, but eventually found myself um, uh, in pupillage, amazingly, and, and with two offers for tenancy, believe it or not. And because in those days it was six months tenants, uh, tenancies. And um, I then started practice and I was practicing from chambers um, in Lincoln's Inn for most of my career. So that's from about 1997 until about five years ago. And then those chambers folded uh, and then I moved to my present chambers. 
Um, so I've been in two in two chambers, but basically doing the same thing um, since uh, well about 1997, something like that. And that's that's my story. Uh, and I'll tell you more about it if you ask me later on. Great, thank you so much, um, Chris. And we'll move to Georgina if you want to introduce yourself. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for giving up your time to come and be here with us all. Um, my name is Regina Wolf. I'm a barrister at Five Essex Court in Middle Temple. I studied an English degree and I then went to a non-Oxbridge university and got a 2-1. So I just want to reassure there'll be lots of you out there thinking, oh my goodness, I didn't go to Oxford or Cambridge. I don't have a first and you'll be worrying about whether or not you can make it. You can make it, um, but you do need to show academic skills and you do need to show that you're really determined. Um, I got countless rejections for pupillage. I remember thinking that I was going to be snapped up and being in immediately disabused of that one. I couldn't even get mini pupillages to begin with. But I worked really hard to work out where the gaps were in my CV. I did lots and lots of um, work experience in all sorts of ways. And I thought about what areas of law I wanted to practice. And I wasn't somebody who knew, right, I want to do crime or I want to do commercial, a bit like um, Chris had spoken about. I really wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And I narrowed it down by doing mini pupillages and finding I didn't enjoy them. And I finally got it down. I thought I was going to do some sort of civil law and I definitely wasn't going to do any human rights because that was really difficult. And it was what all the really clever, brilliant people in my law course were doing. So I had written that off and I find myself with a human rights practice. Um, people say that your practice finds you rather than you finding your practice. And what happened to me was I was actually very lucky because a friend of mine did a mini pupillage at my chambers and he came back from it and he said, I found where you belong. This is your set. And he was completely right. I don't think that's going to happen to, to most people, but it does talk, it does show you a bit of the value of mini pupillage because I then did a mini pupillage and I just absolutely loved it. And you don't really know what a chambers is like until you've put your foot in the door. So I really encourage you all to do as many mini pupillages as you can. My practice um, involves representing primarily the police and the government in civil matters. And people hear that and think, oh my goodness, that sounds awful. Why would you want to represent the police? They're always the bad guy. They've shot the wrong person. Um, they've done something wrong. Their practices are discriminatory. There are all sorts of reasons why you wouldn't want to act for them. And the same applies to the government. And to anyone who might think that, I cannot um, recommend enough a police and government practice. It is huge fun, but it's also a fabulous way. If you really want to change the system and you really want to make a difference to the world and feel at the end of each day like you're doing something really good for mankind, acting for the police and the government is a brilliant way to do it. And I'll tell you why. Lots of people think, well, I want to sue the police. I want to sue the government so that I can make a change. And of course, you can make a change like that. But what I can do is I can sit down with very senior police officers, very senior ministers, um, civil servants, and I can say, your systems are wrong and you need to change them. Or you've done something wrong and you need to make amends. You need to settle. You need to make it right with this family. And that is a fabulous and amazing privilege to be able to do that. I often walk into court and I already know that I have made a difference before you know the first words have come out of my mouth in legal submissions. So please don't think, okay, I only want to do claimant work. There is a huge benefit to doing defendant work as well. Um, just to give you some a bit of a flavour about what um, a practice like that looks like. Um, at the moment, I am acting for some undercover police officers in the undercover policing inquiry. I am acting for the government in the Dawn Sturgis inquest, which is the woman who was killed by Novichok. Um, so that is going to be absolutely fascinating. I'm really excited about that one. I am acting for the government in a case, an inquest about an imam who was murdered. I'm acting for a police force in the Fishmongers Hall inquest, those terrorist attacks um, that happened. So that's just those sort of some of the cases that I'm doing at the moment. Um, just to give you an answer, just in case you think it's all high profile, glamorous, exciting things. I've also recently defended a police force where there was an allegation that an inspector twisted the nipple of a police constable. So it's the sublime and the ridiculous um, at the same time. Um, the last thing I just wanted to say is that I made a podcast with one of my colleagues in Chambers, the lovely Beatrice Collier, called the Pupillage Podcast. And if you're looking to learn more about practice areas and thinking about where you want to practice and want some tips and advice, 
um, please have a look. It's available through the Middle Temple website or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and we hope that that is a really helpful um, resource for students who are trying to get pupillage. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Georgina. Now uh, we move to Kama Mele to also introduce herself. Hello, everyone. My name is Carmeli. I was called in 97. Perhaps some similarities to some of the panel in terms of upbringing. I hate mentioning things like this, frankly, but I, in terms of encouraging diverse applications and making people feel that they fit, then it is important to sort of do that um, discussion about beginnings. So, yeah, very mixed during the week with my mum, single parent, social housing, free school meals, etc. But also with the weekends with my dad, Asian, uh, different religious background, different class, different culture. So, you know, fit, fitting between the two, left home young at 16. And so then had all sorts of jobs, including managing a skateboard shop, Banksy Shutter, no doubt, in Bristol. Um, and I did my A-levels at night school and managed to get to a Russell Group University. I came up to Leeds and similarly to others on our panel, to one from Leeds. And I'm afraid I left thinking because I'd done my A-levels at night and I'd had a rough start and all the rest of it. I thought I'd had this amazing achievement. I thought pupillages would come my way from, you know, the, the, the great sets of chambers. And I had a rude awakening come bar school. So didn't get pupillage on my first round and that I, I was in a Scot middle temple scholarship house and I was everybody else had about five pupillage offers it was a really really tough period of time that um remember it well and then pu a pupillage came up in Leeds I have to say up until that point I'd planned to be in London doing judicial review or human rights something like that had some mini pupillages and found I was watching planning law over and over again and was really depressed by that. Found a pupillage, pupillage came up in Leeds and although I had no plans to settle up here, although I come to university here, I had no links at all. I had family in London and Bristol, but nothing in the North. I thought, well, I just want to get qualified. I may move, you know, in a few years, but actually moved up to Leeds, realised that had a mixed pupillage, so you saw everything, family, civil, crime, realised I wanted to be a jury advocate fundamentally and, and certainly at that stage wanted to defend and realised that grad fees are the same everywhere in the country. I am um, particularly, you know, looking ahead as a mum, I was able to do the school run um, at both ends of the day within 20 minutes I can be I can have dropped my kids to school and be at chambers you know so don't dis I would say don't dismiss necessarily life outside of London in terms of ease of living um, and you know and the quality of work that, that there still is outside of London so it's a small set of chambers to begin with moved within Leeds made my home here um, took Silk 2016 and, and moved back into doing some family work since then, the findings of fat cases. So I do, you know, normal sort of murders. Um, so I specialise in cases involving children and with vulnerable witnesses and using the pre-recorded evidence scheme. Um, a lot of that as well as the findings of fact in, in family cases. Um, and I'll get on to my tips for people a little later on. So that's my story. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone on the panel for giving um, such great introductions. We're gonna move now to some of the more pupillage specific um, questions. And I know a lot of you touched on how you kind of decided on your, or fell into your um, area of practice. Um, so kind of just following up from that, how did you go about selecting the chambers that you wanted to apply to? So even if you're not at the chambers that you um, initially did your pupillage at, when you were in that position, did you have a particular process um, of selecting them? Uh, anyone can start and don't feel pressured to answer every single question. Um, you can do it as you desire. Shall I kick off? Because I haven't said much about uh, Chancery Commercial Chambers. Um, 
as I said in my intro, I was always kind of interested in the business and finance side. I was trading and derivatives and things like that whilst I was doing my law degree. I then went and did my specialist LLM. And I think possibly more than most people, I knew from quite an early time the sort of thing that I was interested in. Um, I like this kind of, um, it wasn't, you know, the sort of jury stuff didn't turn me on. I was more interested in the sort of challenging law. Um, I was interested, I sort of looked at possibly doing tax, doing financial, and then I hit on kind of insolvency as being an area I was really interested in because uh, fundamentally you get to meet people from all sorts of backgrounds who've been normally incredibly successful at some point and then for whatever reason they've fallen on hard times that can either be in a business capacity or in a personal capacity and so you're meeting really interesting people and you get this amazing combination of intellectual stimulation from the legal side of it and it involves not just insolvency law but all sorts of areas of law like for example um, um, property is a big one because obviously most Property is normally a big part of people's assets um, and company law and that sort of thing was that was quite stimulating for me. Um, and I, I didn't want to, how can I put it, um, I didn't want to, you know, to get involved in the sort of seedy side of life. I remember doing when I was a pupil, um, I, was do, I did a, a, a conference with a, on a, with a criminal practitioner. And I just found the whole thing really uh, difficult to handle because the guy was obviously lying through his teeth to his barrister because he obviously knew he had to. Um, and I just thought, look, I want to help people who want to help themselves. That was what I was sort of motivated by. And I was fascinated with this sort of um, this sort of commercial side of things. So when I applied to the bar to do my pupillage, I pretty much knew at that point what areas I wanted to do. There was something in those days called the pupillage handbook, and it kind of listed every chambers um, or most chambers. And so you basically went through, you picked out every single chambers that did this kind of area of law that you were interested in and you wrote through every single one of them. It wasn't really rocket science. Things have changed a lot since then. Things are a lot more advanced. You need to you know, show you probably a lot more aptitude and intellect in the way that you make your applications. Of course, the systems now, if you're, if you're part of them, um, um, you know, the gateway, as I think it's called now, previously the old pass system, you were, you were required to choose a limited number of chambers, which I can understand the sort of logic of. Um, but, um, you know, that wasn't the case in my day. So basically, I, I just applied to everywhere I could and hope for the best uh, and then I thought, well, people will slim me, slim me down. And what I would say, though, is um, do your thinking about what areas of the law you want to do, go into or you're interested in at the sort of mini pupillage stage. I think it's great to have to also not be clear and to have lots of interests. But I think when you apply for pupillage at that stage, you should know roughly the kind of broad area that you're interested in. Lots of people in my chambers, because we do in my chambers, it's not just corporate, you know, and commercial law. Um, lots of people are, don't know when they come and become pupils, what they want to do within the sort of um, chancery commercial field, which is a pretty broad field. Um, I won't go into the various different um, avenues, but but by the time they finish their pupillage, normally they've got on with someone and they, they, they kind of like certain solicitors and then, then, then they sort of um, get more selective from there. But, but um, when you go for your pupillage interviews and you make your applications, you need to tell chambers why it is you're applying to them. If you don't know at that point why you're applying to them, you're not going to go any further. So think about it. Try and focus on the broad areas, at least, that the Chambers offers and, 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 and know that that's what you want to do when you apply. Anyway, I've probably said enough. I'll let somebody else have a say. I, I'm going to jump in. I, I agree with everything um, Christopher said. One thing I think is really important is to make sure that you apply to a spectrum of chambers, particularly if you've never applied for pupillage before. You don't know where you are in terms of how you compare to other students. And I've got a very good friend who is absolutely brilliant on paper. He did the BCL at Oxford. He's just superbly clever. And he, knowing that he was brilliant, he applied to all of the top tier chambers and he got onto the reserve lists for lots of them and he never got the pupillage. Um, he applied again the next time he put down a few that were not quite such Premier League sets and of course he snapped up, you know, he was snapped up. So make sure that you apply to a spectrum of chambers and, and it's, that's easier said than done because you don't actually probably know where, which are the best chambers and which aren't. So look at things like the Legal 500 and Chambers UK to see which sets are recommended in the areas that you want to practice. 
Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I do police law, which is a really narrow niche. Um, there are two big sets that do police law, but there are lots of sets that do a little bit of police law. So I would apply to them, but it's really important to tailor your form, because if I had applied to a set that did a tiny bit of police law, maybe had four pr practitioners, and I said, this is all I want to do, I'm, I'm desperate for police law, they, those sets would have thought, well, she's not going to be happy here because she doesn't want to do our employment practice or our personal injury practice. So I tailored my form so that I looked like I was their ideal practitioner. And I don't think that there's anything um, wrong about doing that. I think you've got to be pragmatic in your approach. So have a look at what um, sets do and look both, bear in mind that all of the websites are designed for solicitors. So sets will say, we do lots of sports law, or they'll pick some sexy new area of law that they want to get into. And just be aware that they might not actually have very many people who practice that area of law. And if you go all in on that area, you may not be picked up because we want you to be happy in our chambers. And we think if you um, want to practice an area of law that we don't really do, or we've only got one or two practitioners, you might not be, um, be happy. And the last thing I would say is keep open-minded and try and convey your open-mindedness on your form. Um, there'll be some people who really aren't sure what they want to do and they will apply to big sets that do some crime, some family, some civil law. That's fantastic. I don't think there's anything wrong with identifying that you are open minded, keen to learn. Um, you perhaps haven't had experience in one of Chambers main practice areas. Don't be afraid to say, you know, I don't know everything about insurance law, but I've read this article. I'm really interested in it and I'm very keen to learn more. I, I think it's really important to stay open minded. Well, thank you so much, uh, Georgina. Sticking to applying to a specific chamber. Uh, sometimes uh, we understand that many privileges as well as uh, marshalling experiences are important as they expose you uh, to life as a good uh, barrister, so to say. Uh, but considering the certainty that has been brought by COVID, as well as even the privilege uh, gateway, the deadline, which is around a February. Uh, some students feel that they may not have gotten the chance to have, you know, quite some uh, many privileges uh, experiences. So what would you say can boost uh, such a student's uh, application in terms of uh, getting selected for privilege? Shall I jump in, uh, Samuel? Yes, please, you can. I, mean, I think that's a really good question and, 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 and actually and kind of links in with, with the point that Christopher was making earlier. Uh, any pupillage interview, uh, you're almost certainly going to be asked, why do you want to apply to X Chambers? Why do you want to be at X Chambers? What do you think you'll bring to X Chambers? So you need to know something about those chambers and you need to be able to express and articulate what it is about those chambers that has attracted you and how you will fit into and what you've got to offer those chambers and tailor yourself to fitting in um, and, and being able to tick all the boxes that you know those chambers will be interested in, in, in looking for in a, in a candidate. So if you can't do a mini pupillage, which is virtually impossible to do in, in the current climate, um, there are other things you can do. I mean, lots of chambers at the moment are doing online um, Zoom events, try and attend as many of those as you possibly can, uh, especially now that we're in the digital age and there's not a limited number of uh, participants who can turn up at a Chambers event. Um, you know, no Chambers is going to say no to you if you say, can I just sit in on, on a Zoom event? Sit on it and get to hear what uh, practitioners have got to say about their work and, and, and see how the Chambers talks about their work. Uh, another thing is if you can't, you know, actually go to court with a practitioner, you know, reach out to individual practitioners, call someone up and say, can I ask you a little bit about your practice? Can I ask you a little bit about your chambers? Most people will, 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 will almost certainly give you the time and want to answer those questions that you've got. And in that way, you can get a bit more experience and a bit more insight into what a particular chambers is like and what a particular chambers is, is, is looking for. Um, I, I'd also, I know it doesn't specifically answer this question, Samuel, but really, really like to echo the point that Georgina made. Um, you know, applying to a spectrum of chambers is so, so important. You know, don't put all your eggs in one basket and go for all the top chambers. Um, just to build on that, there's so much movement at the bar at the moment. You can move, you know, start out in, in, a, in a chambers that perhaps isn't the, the, the best chambers in any particular area of law. 
start out in one that does the area of law that you're interested in. And A, you may love it and want to stay there for the rest of your life. But if you don't, and if you build up a good practice, it's, you know, it's not uncommon now for people to move from one set to another. Um, so you know, we only offer uh, two people, which is a year at Dow Street, I think, but, but people who we've seen during the interview and pupillage process invariably come back to us in two, three, four years time after they built up their practice and gotten their experience somewhere else. So you know, it's really important, as, as Georgina said, to, 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 to apply to a range of chambers and don't think that you're too good for any chambers. All, all, all chambers offer a really unique and interesting experience. There briefly uh, as well if I can I, I obviously I agree with every, everything that's been said I think in in non-covid times the one thing that I really push is just trying to get to your local courts just to go without um, a, a mini pupillage just to attend and be in the public gallery I'm always quite surprised to be honest particularly if people want to do cases it's, it's obviously difficult in children um, law or other hearings in private but the vast majority of hearings are in public and I think if you're regularly attending courts those barristers will get to know you and see you if you very politely when they're not looking stressed ask if you can ask them a question and engage them um, and you have something useful to kind of bring to that discussion sometimes you can make really good connections in that way there are not many jobs where you can walk in and observe you know it, if you want to be an accountant you don't get to walk into an accountancy firm and, and watch discussions taking place that the law is unique in that you can do that to so take advantage of it um, when looking at your applications this is an unusual one it may might not kind of fit particularly this question but it's a piece of advice i like to give is don't overlook if you're applying to chambers so to be a self-employed barrister that in addition to joining a profession you are also opening a business and that you are self-employed and you are opening your own market store so if you have anything that you can push that appeal to that commercial element, don't feel that you shouldn't include it. So if you know, for example, that there are four major firms of solicitors that instruct a set of chambers and you have work experience there, that particular work experience in your connections to the commercial end of the business of chambers is really crucial. And sometimes we've even interviewed pupils, we've interviewed them and realized that somebody is actually gonna be self-sufficient because they've got a rich stream of work in particular areas. And we have gone on and offered more pupillages than we were expecting to because one of them isn't such a commercial gamble for a set of chambers. So do push that. And I say this final remark, and it's not a criticism for anyone, because you'll have noticed I have my screen photograph up of my embarrassing photograph of Mary in the nativity. Still a prouder moment than taking silk, I have to say. But if you're attending the Zoom stuff and you're going, not necessarily this, but you're making connections and you're a Zoom event in upset chambers, put your camera on that I go to so many events. I'm really not being critical. I don't want you all to put your camera on now. I speak at quite a lot of events and I am speaking only to names, to a complete sea of 40 turned off cameras. And actually the couple of people who've put their screen on are the ones I kind of almost end up engaging with. I can see them nodding along and I draw them into the conversation. So I think particularly at smaller events, I do think you have to sort of ask the questions and, and put yourself out there. And, and also to echo other things, this is quite a unique profession in that we have always looked after our own and, and done everything pro bono, all our training, CPD at the bar is always free. And that culture remains. If you contact, if I've ever had a contact on social media with somebody, you know, on Twitter, somebody asking my advice or something like that, the vast majority of the bar will engage with that. You know, so as long as you approach it in the right way, people do want to help. So reach out, even not just emailing chambers, but via social media. Great. Thank you so much, um, everyone, for all of your answers so far. I feel like everyone is just putting so much um, excellent advice into the discussion. Uh, moving on um, slightly differently, um, this is more so specifically about uh, things that a lot of students ask about their value and their weight on applications 
So could any of you speak to how much weight um, scholarships and awards or prizes, um, as well as any pro bono work, what weight do each of those have um, if you're looking at an application? Can I start with this one? Um, basically, it's not necessarily about you've got to have this or you've got to have that, like a scholarship or something that you think sounds really good. It's just about standing out. That's a really important thing. Because when I applied, as I described before, um, I mean, there was only one bar school. So there was therefore only a limited number, a set sort of number of people who were applying for pupillage. Of course, there might be the people that went to bar school the year before, but on the whole, it was a sort of relatively set number. And um, therefore, the amount of people applying to any particular chambers, obviously there'd be more applying to the, the top sets than there would be to the, the lesser sets, if you like. But at the same time, not an enormous number of people, probably I wouldn't have thought applying to the Chancery Bar. Things have completely changed. The lid has come off the number of applicants and with that the quality of the applicants has gone up as well and also the ch chancery bar in terms of you know the type of people applying and wanting to go to the chancery bar i'm pleased to say has changed enormously i felt like a complete fish out of water at the chancery bar when i first um when i first went there my first pupil master was brilliant because well i remember on my very first day um, he said to me, oh, um, this is the Chancery Walk. And he did an impression a bit like sort of Faulty Towers of the, the way in which people walk around Lincoln's Inn. And I just thought that was brilliant. It really, really um, relaxed me in his company. And that, but that was the way in which people were at the Chancery Bar. Everyone had a waistcoat. I mean, they looked like something from a different century, frankly. Um, and I felt totally, um, you know, even though I wanted, I was interested in that area of the law, I just felt, um, you know, like a stick in the mud now i'm pleased to say things have changed a lot and i'd like to think it was partly because people like me there are more of them at the bar than there used to be but but on the whole the world has changed enormously i mean that's the most important point and the bar in every part of the bar really wants to uh change in terms of encouraging people from uh, a broader areas than than previously went to the bar particularly at the chancery bar um and now how successful we've been is debatable but things are changing and that's no doubt why all of us um are uh, you know hosting this event and glad to glad to do so um now the, to the question um when you apply um because we in my chambers we get typically say 180 something like that applicants and we're offering either one or maximum of two uh, pupillages um everyone's got top academics okay that is a given um you know th th you're going to struggle if you haven't got good academics but that's just a given that's not what we spend our time looking at and obviously, if you've got a, a, an absolutely star CV with all sorts of prizes and all the rest of it, that's great. I'm not suggesting for a minute you don't put that on. But what I'm, but you know, in a way, we see a lot of that. Uh, and what I look for when I'm looking at an application is something that's a bit different, something that makes the person stand out from the typical applicant for this kind of pupillage. Um, and that means something maybe. They, did, they were great at sport. Maybe they, were, they had another interest that's transferable. Maybe they showed a real aptitude, some, a real struggle in their life, which they overcame. Uh, maybe it was something to do with, I don't know, um, their interest in pro bono work, some, just something. I, it doesn't have to be anything. I mean, in my chambers, we use um, a company that helps us contextualize applications, which I think is a great idea. In other words, you know, to try and identify things that are a bit different about people. Um, and that encourages us to look at people in a different way, in a way that we might not be used to, so that we don't end up just choosing people that look exactly like ourselves. Um, so so, th so that's what I would say. Um, I'm not going to go on any further. I just say, make sure that when whatever is special about you, whatever is a bit different about you, make sure that's on your form, because that's what people want to know about. Can I jump in? Um... Everyone who is doing pupillage assessment at the moment has to do something called the fair recruitment training. And that teaches us how to go about recruiting consistently and reliably and to set aside unconscious bias and all of the things that we might bring to the table. 
um, you can get some insight into fair recruitment training by Googling the fair recruitment guide. I think the most recent one is something like 2015. Um, and that has got in it a template that shows us how to mark application forms. And one of the things that it encourages us to do is to have certain starred criteria. So um, Caitlin asked about um, the weight that we give to different things. Every chambers can decide on the weight that we might want to give to certain things. And there will be some chambers, so a commercial chancery set like Chris's is going to put a lot of weight on your academic ability. A criminal set is going to put a lot of weight on your advocacy skills and whether or not you can stand up and talk in court persuasively. So it's going to be different for all sorts of different areas of practice, but it's really worthwhile having a look at that form and thinking about where you will do well and where you might need to fill some gaps with some more work experience. I realise that the deadline is coming up and trying to do more work experience at the moment is not easy, but you, know, you may find yourself reapplying again next year. So these are the things that you can do. Um, you asked about scholarships and prizes and what weight we give to them. I suspect that they won't be a starred criteria for any chambers, but the value we give to them is it means that somebody else within the profession has taken a look at you and decided that you are good and that you are likely to make it as a barrister. So we do give scholarships and prizes some weight for that reason. Um, some of you may think, oh my goodness, I don't have top academics. How am I, how am I going to cope? What does that mean? Well, first of all, think about the areas of practice. As I say, for a commercial chancery set, you're going to need those, you know, the, those glittering accolades. But if you're looking at a different kind of set, um, there are various things that you can do. One thing is to put a breakdown of your marks. You may not have a first overall, but I bet you've got some really good individual marks. You can include those. You can explain if you've got a high 2-1 rather than just a, a common or garden 2-1, for example. And then another thing that I think is a really good idea is to try and win an essay prize. Essay prizes don't actually um, have very many entrants because you're all incredibly busy, no one's got time to do them. So the competition is not as tough as you might think. And if you can win an essay prize, you will increase the sort of academic value that you are bringing. So even if your degree is not brilliant, you might be able to say in the section about why you're going to make it as a, you know, why you're going to be a good barrister, you can say, I have shown my academic skills through winning this essay prize that shows that I'm academically strong. So don't panic if you think, gosh, I haven't got that first. Um, there are other ways that you can do it. Thank you so much. Um, that will move us to a completely different question. Uh, I've understood from the discussion so far that uh, you don't need to put all your eggs in one basket. So definitely it's advisable to apply to as many chambers as possible. So the question is, as students, in order to apply to as many chambers as possible, you might be tempted to be doing uh, copy and pasting. So we want to ask that, uh, is there a way that you're able to detect if there is some copy and paste throughout your application? Yes, you put down the wrong chamber's name, which happens all the time. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. I don't know if any okay. other uh, member may want to express something about it, yeah. We don't, uh, certainly in our chambers, um, and I'm not sure of any that do, we don't use any plagiarism software, for example, to look for such things. And of course, you're going to cut and paste to some extent because you've been asked very similar questions over dozens and dozens of forms. But, you know, if you go word blind with it, have somebody else read it, the, the number of applications that will say things such as, and we're on the Northeastern Circuit, I've always dreamed of practicing on the Northwest. Or, or other such comments that you know that it's a cut and paste job and, and you know, it's not impressive. Even if you try and keep an open mind about that and aware of the pressures that people are under, it's not impressive. So if you're gonna cut and paste, really careful proofreading. Yeah, you, you will cut and paste, of course you will. You're answering why you want to be a barrister how you know 15 times or 20 times so you know we're realistic that you will cut and paste don't worry about that there's nothing wrong with doing it just make sure that you tailor your form so even if um i mean for example if we see a form that says you know this 
showed me why I was passionate about commercial law. We don't do any commercial law. That's going to, I'm afraid, is going to be a reason that we're, we're looking to get rid of you because we think, well, that's, you know, you're not being genuine with us. Even though we totally understand that you've got to put in lots of different applications and some of those chambers will be to commercial chambers. Thank you. Can I say something as well? I think I remember making doing this in a way of obviously going to write the same things to lots of different people but the, in order to not get caught out I actually hand wrote my letters so that way you can't make that mistake that <laughs> that is inevitably going to creep in if you apply to too many chambers but assuming you're not going to do that which I think is wise my right I don't know how I got a, a, an interview even because my writing is so appalling uh, but but it, it took me a long time but but um, um, what I would say is this yes your letters are going to be cut and pasted to some extent make sure that you get somebody else to read them before they go out because you won't spot the, the mistakes and other people will when they read them because you would have read that letter 50 times 100 times you will have overlooked certain things so make sure you get somebody else to look at it um and and what i'd say is that when you um when you apply just pick out one or two things about that particular chamber and make sure that goes into the into the letter. Although, as I said earlier, I mean, I, it was pretty unsophisticated the way I went about it. And I wouldn't go about it in the same way now, knowing what I know. But, um, you know, I sort of scattergunned my applications. Um, and, and I suppose it didn't end up being too many chambers because there weren't too many chambers doing that sort of particular area that I was interested in. But what I would say is, although you should apply to lots of different chambers and, and different types of chambers for the reasons we've given, Make sure that you do your research on the particular chambers that you are applying for. And that might have an effect on the number of chambers, actually, that you can really apply to. Because you're better off maximizing your chances for, say, 10 or 20 chambers than just writing the same standard letter to a 50 chambers. I mean, you know, you've really got to do the work. And this is where you've got a huge advantage over what the position was in my day. As I mentioned before, all we had to go on was this sort of one page in a book for each chambers of something called the chambers guide just setting out the areas of law if you could do a little bit more research you you know you would try to but there wasn't a lot of information that i had in, in in most cases um now we've all got websites we're all so proud of what we do that we write it out in huge detail i can tell you as regards my chambers we give everything away on our website if you go and actually spend the time to look at everything that's set out there, you will know exactly what to say, what questions we're gonna ask you in the interviews, and pretty much, therefore, you'll have a good clue as to how to respond. Use that to your advantage. You read it before you make your application, and for goodness sake, make sure you read it in real detail before you go to any interview, because you will be asked about it. The other thing I'd say is just this, very briefly. If you're gonna say something in your letter or in your CV, you are going to be asked about it. One of the things I learned as a pupil is that when you plead something, it means you've got to prove it. That was a lesson I learned fairly early on. The same thing applies here to your letter. Think of it like a pleading. You're gonna to have to prove it. You are gonna get asked about it. So if you put something down, be ready to, to give some more information about it when asked. Can I give you an embarrassing story? Yeah. Um, to yeah. emphasize what Chris has just said. I, the first time I applied for a Middle Temple scholarship, I had a cripplingly bad interview. I mean, it was just, even now I feel mortified thinking about it. Um, and the reason it was so bad was that I didn't know anything about law. I just read English and I thought, oh, what area of law might I want to practice? I know I'll do intellectual property because I assumed having done no research, intellectual property was all about plagiarism. And I was therefore going to meet lots of authors and I was gonna have a lovely time going to literary events. Now, for any of you who know about intellectual property, you'll know that it's all about science and patents and biology, and you really need to have a science background. And I sat down in front of probably three very distinguished silks and they cross-examined me. And I had not realized that they were gonna cross-examine me because of course that's what they do. And I had this just, it was so embarrassing. They said, so you're interested in intellectual property and um, well, tell us about a case that you've read. Now, the truthful answer was that I had never read a case and I didn't know where I would find a case and let alone read a case. And I said, oh, well, I've, I followed the JK Rowling litigation with interest. 
and which wasn't really true. I'd, you know, might have like read one article about it. And they said, oh, do you think she was guilty of plagiarism? And I said, oh, yes, I do, I do. Yeah, it's very important to, to take a view. And they said, why? And I said, um, well, I thought she'd stolen the sense of magic from John Macefield, which was just so embarrassing. And I could see them all just pretty much writing big crosses on their marking forms. Um, anyway, I tell you all that because partly to say, don't talk nonsense because you will be found out. These are people, you know, barristers are trained to undermine you and to expose you if you're telling any sort of untruth. So make sure you do your research, but also don't be disheartened. I went on the next year, I went in so well prepared to that scholarship interview and I got a scholarship the next time around. Um, and I'm still here to tell the tale. So you will face these awful and embarrassing moments, but um, it's not the end of the world. Can I just jump in uh, uh, and, just, and to talk a little bit about the flip side? Of course, it's really important to, uh, to apply to lots of chambers, but also bear in mind that people who are going through your applications are looking through tens, if not hundreds of applications, and we go through them very, very, very quickly. And you know, as an advocate, it's not just about oral advocacy in court. Part of our job is written advocacy as well. So use your application form to demonstrate your ability at written advocacy and persuading someone that you are the right person to take on. But, but also bear in mind that people are going through them very, very quickly. So instead of having, if there's a, a question that requires a, a long answer, if they give you two, three, four hundred words to answer a particular uh, a, a question, don't just have a whole lot of, 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 of prose and um, break it up, have different paragraphs, have headings, uh, highlight if you're able to on the application form, highlight certain words um, and make it as clear as possible for someone who's looking at that very, very quickly to get all the really salient and important information in seconds rather than minutes and having to trawl through it and find out exactly the, what the, the point that you're trying to make. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to ask the final question and then we're going to move into um, some of the audience questions. We've received a lot, so i um, really excited to get to those. So just as kind of a roundup question for this um, segment, what would you say would be your biggest no-no for a written application and then also at interview? So what would make you personally um, say no to giving a candidate pupillage? Who wants to start? Uh, Stephen, do you want to start? I know you just spoke, but you can start. <laughs> You're on mute. Can't hear you. Uh, I wasn't saying that. I was thinking what to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, and it links back to what I said at the beginning about uh, evidence base. And I think it's a point that, that that everyone has made in different ways up until now as well. Th there's no point saying. Um, I'm interested in X or Y, unless you can back it up by evidence now. I mean, we're all uh, trained uh, when we go into a selection process to try and drill down and find out whether you are the genuine article and whether you really do do what you say you do and whether you are able to do what you say you're able to do. So try and back up everything you say with, with evidence and don't put things down that you can't back up and that you don't know anything about. I mean, I think that is the, the real no-no, both in your written application and in, in, in interview as well. And if you don't know the answer to something in interview, just say, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that. Don't, don't, um, don't, don't, um, don't try and blag it because you will get caught out. I mean, that, that, that's the bottom line and, and everyone appreciates um, openness and, and, and you being up front and saying, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer to that and then, and then moving on. Um, or ask them to frame the question in, in a different way. Ask, you know, if you know, it happens in court. I mean, I, I, the amount of times I've been in court and a, a, a judge asks the question and I, and I simply don't know <laughs> the answer to it. But you know, if you can ask a question back, can you ask a little bit more? Can you clarify what you exactly mean by that? Can you give me a little bit more information? Um, uh, you know, give me a little bit more of the background and then then try and answer the question when, when you have a bit more information um, be before you answer it. Yeah, I think the, the biggest no-no is a sense from the candidate that they don't really know about our chambers, that they haven't actually done the research, that they've just put us in maybe as a backup option, 
or because they've just happened to like something that we've tweeted rather than actually understanding our areas of work and what our ethos is and doing a bit of research. Um, every year we get some amazing candidates but who don't look like they're actually genuinely interested in us. And I always imagine them getting their rejection letters that, you know, these people who've probably never been rejected for anything. They've got these glittering academic credentials, all sorts of fascinating work experience, but it's not really in our area of law. And they haven't explained why they're interested in our area of law. And that's a, a really big turnoff. I'd say another turnoff in the interview is when somebody is overly trying to impress you and is sort of dropping in all of the cases that you've done it's almost like they've gone the other way and they can it can come across really um sort of earnest and a bit over the top whereas what you really want is somebody who who is who has that information is able to deploy it appropriately but isn't just falling over themselves to talk about how you've done this case and this case and this case um because that can come across badly too can I, can I just add one other thing? I, 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 the other thing I think is, don't, is, 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 it's twofold. And one, be yourself and don't try and sound like what you think a barrister should sound like. You've got, you've got to be the genuine article. You've got to just be yourself because you know, if you're pretending to be something that you're not, it will come out straight away. So just be yourself and, 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 and be as genuine as you can be and don't think this is what a barrister is supposed to sound like and try and try and emulate that and be like that. Can I just come in as well? I agree with everything that's been said, but there's just the one word about applications, I think, for outside of London, so applications for pupillage on circuit. Um, as much as it's absolutely right, I took a pupillage up in the northeast expecting to move and then didn't. Chambers will want to see a, some commitment to that local area when you're making pupillage applications outside of London. I think it's important to include that. Pupillage is a huge investment for a set of chambers. Um, not only is it someone's time and money, and obviously, you know, we're all self-employed, so that's all coming out of our pockets. And so we really, really want to invest in that pupil and for them to stay, for them to qualify and leave after a year or two, you know, is so demoralizing for chambers, but it also can ha leave you with big gaps then of experience um, as, as time goes on. So show some connection if you can to that local area or some indication that you are prepared to commit to, to that area. Um, and I do think it's worth covering that in your applications. My bugbear, and we have touched on it a little bit on written pupillage applications, or in fact, answers at interview, is kind of waffly management speak stuff that I just don't understand. I think I'm just too old. And there's all these words and phrases that j just actually don't mean anything to me. Um, so try and avoid that and actually just say what you're trying to say. I think that's what you're saying as well. Is it, it, it's not just be your authentic accent, but your actual voice in terms of making the point that you want to say and don't just use words because you think that a barrister would put them. And this was also touched on before, bold assertions about, you know, I am driven, I am dynamic, I am ambitious, I am a great advocate. It's just so worthless, you know, unless it is evidenced in some way. You know, even if the, the sentence is uncomfortable and clunky, because you are then saying, and I demonstrated that by, or, and I, you know, for example, in this, but without it, the assertion is just meaningless and carries no weight always the person who writes, I'm a perfectionist who's got loads of mistakes on their application form as well. Um, on that point, just a really tiny bugbear. It drives me nuts. No one spells practice right. Um, I would think probably about a third of forms misspell the word practice. There are two ways to spell it. It is both a noun and a verb and they're spelt differently. If you think about advice and advise, practice is the same. My legal practice is spelt with a C. I practice law is spelt with an S, so make sure that you get that right. I would say this. Um, if you look on a, our website, you'll be told what the fact, what the issue, you know, how we rank people. Um, uh, Georgie, Georgina was talking about this earlier, you know, there's certain set criteria. If you just write down those, those criteria and then you turn those into questions and you simply address those questions in your letter and at every time, every opportunity you can, you're going to succeed. 
Okay, we don't really want to know, unless it's something really regaling, uh, uh, we don't really want to know about everything else. We don't really want a load of guff in your letter. Uh, as Stephen says, we want it in not quite bullet point form, because it's got to be written, it's got to be in English to show that you can actually write in English, but something concise, something to the point, something that shows that you have the ability to take a lot of information and then summarize it in a way that's quite punchy because that's what oral advocacy is all about. Great, thank you so much. So that wraps up that um, section and we're gonna take some of the questions that we've got from the audience. Um, I'll start with the first question, which any of you can answer. Um, should candidates put unsuccessful mooting or advocacy experience on their applications? So, for example, if they get knocked out in the first or second round, um, how do chambers view unsuccessful mooting experiences on applications? Do they see them as failed attempts and therefore you're not suited to the bar or an interest in a career at the bar? For my part, and you're, you're going to hear different things from different barristers because that's inevitable, I think put them down. I don't think that there's a duty of full and frank disclosure in a pupillage application form. So I would say, you know, mooting, including these competitions, and don't say where you ranked if you didn't rank anywhere. Um, it's obviously better if you were hugely successful, but it shows that you're interested and it's much better to show that you've done some mooting competitions than that you haven't done any. I absolutely agree with that. that, that that's a no brainer for me. I, I would have thought, you'd, you you know, the fact is you participated in it. There's amazing a number of students I find who are too scared to moot, but they're quite happy to enter the career at the bar, which seems odd. So yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Phrase it in that way or similarly and put it down that you've been part of it. I mean, I, if it's any guide on my, on my chamber's profile, I put down the cases that I lose as well as the cases that I win. So, um, it's worth including all your experience on, on, on an application, I would have thought. Yeah, I would say you've got to put down something that shows that you haven't just decided to come to the bar with no experience or <laughs> attempt to find out what it's going to be about. So you've got to put down something. Now, on the other hand, if you are really good at one thing and not so good at another, you don't need to put down both of those things, right? You've got to tick the box or somebody else will tick the box to show that you've thought about it. But you can marshal, you can choose. It's, there's no duty of full and frank disclosure, I think somebody's already said. You, you know, again, that's part of the advocate skill, isn't it? If you've got five things or five arguments, you don't run every five arguments. What you do is you take your best three. And that's what I would advise you to do on your form as well. Of, of course, if you haven't got anything else, but that failed moot out in the first round, you put it down. Absolutely you do, because if you haven't got anything, you're not going to get the interview. But if you've got that, then at least it shows you've thought about it and tried to find out about it. Thank you so much. Uh, this is also another question specifically to Stephen Pauls. I think that person might be interested in your area. Uh, the person is asking, what is one thing you love about Dolphy Street Chambers? And can you go international if you do not specialize in international criminal law? Well, if there's, if there's one thing that I love about Dow Street Chambers, it, it's my colleagues. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm really humbled by all the brilliant um, people that I work with and having the opportunity to learn from all of their incredible experience and, and indeed all the, all the staff as well. We've got an amazing team at Dow Street and it's, it's a real... A privilege and a pleasure for, to, to be able to work uh, with them all. Um, in terms of international uh, experience, um, it's kind of a theme really. If you want to specialise in international criminal law, the best thing to do is try and get experience in it. Um, and it, it may seem difficult because a lot of the, the, the internships are abroad, they're in other jurisdictions, they're in The Hague, they're in the, in the, in the States, they're, they're, these, these courts are all over the world. Um, but, but you know, there is funding out there. I think Middle Temple gave me funding to do my first internship um, for three months in The, in the Hague. Um, so there is potentially funding available. Um, you know, alternatively, I think I, for, for one uh, in, internship with Human Rights Watch in New York, I did, um, you know, work part time uh, as a cleaner to get the money together to be able to go out and, and, and spend three months in New York. So, um, uh, you know, get the experience get it on your application form. It shows that you've got an interest in the area and that will help you get, get into it. 
Great, thank you so much, Stephen. Um, we also had a couple more personalized questions, so we're gonna try and ask some of them. Uh, this person has said, at school and college, I wasn't too focused and yet passed with Bs. However, um, I have since gained a 2-1. During the GDL, I passed whilst going through a marriage breakdown. I have become a magistrate, been a paralegal in two areas of law, and so far, despite COVID, uh, the death of close family members, I've passed all exams. Will my average grades at school and A-levels negatively impact my applications? No. No. <laughs> no. No, provided you put it into context, because achievement is all relative, isn't it? As we all know, yeah? The person who's had everything and hasn't really done better than the average, you know, they're not gonna go anywhere. The person who's succeeded, despite the odds, even if they haven't got a first, that's much more interesting. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, this question is also from an international student. Uh, he wants to know that as an international student, if uh, you apply for pupillage, uh, what are your expectations? Will you, uh, you being as an uh, international student have an impact on your application? I, 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 it shouldn't do, but it, but it might. I mean, I think I, we've had this at, at Chambers before where we've had um, applications from um, international, international students, particularly for our international pupillage, which we, we advertised some years ago. I think the, the one thing you need to make sure um, that you're, is that you're gonna be able to work and remain in the UK. I think, it's, I think it's, as, as, as people have said already up until now, that um, you know, it's a, it's a huge investment for Chambers to train someone throughout their pupillage. If the reality is at the end of your pupillage, you're not going to be able to remain and work in the UK, um, Chambers is unlikely. Going, it's going to be it's going to potentially be difficult for Chambers to to to, to recruit you for, for for pupillage. So I think that's the only way that being international could potentially impact on your application. I think you need to be able to make sure and demonstrate that you will be able to. Um, build a practice in the UK and continue working in the UK. Yeah, one thing I'd add as well is if you've got qualifications from somewhere international, I, I took the International Baccalaureate, for example, and um, anyone who's reading your form might not have a clue how that compares to, to English or British A-levels. So there's nothing wrong with saying I got a 500, that equates to four A-levels at A grade or whatever it may be, so that you just make it easy for the person reading the form. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're gonna to move to the next question, which says, when it comes to questions such as why you want to become a barrister, I find it difficult to balance my passion for why I want to be a barrister without sounding cliche. Is it better to leave the passion for a potential interview question and use the application to state points that can be backed by evidence? So how would you essentially approach the why you want to be a barrister question? I'll, I'll answer this or have a go at answering this. I would have thought that was a question for the interview rather than for your CV and your application form uh, or covering letter. Uh, as I said, I mean, you want to be punchy. Uh, if you start off by giving them the sort of story of your life, um, that's not punchy. And I kind of think that, the, you know, um, why you wanted to be a barrister, that sort of a bit more about your background, which might be might be important. I mean, I don't want to rule that out, but um, I wouldn't go into too much detail, I don't think. I mean, I, I believe that my pupillage committee in Chambers looks at letters and expects them to be about two pages long. So if that gives you any indication, you know, you've got to marshal what you're saying um, in that two pages and make sure you uh, include the most important bits. Um, I mean, it's a given, frankly, that you want to be a barrister, um, the history, you know, that's the sort of thing. If you get to the second interview in my chambers, you get an hour um, and that's the sort of time, you know, that you, you'll be asked more detailed questions, I think. Yeah, I, I think, think both, um, sorry, Carmen, go on. I was, 
I was going to say, the question's never going to be, do you want to be a barrister? The question is always going to be, why? Um, and I have seen that on a lot of application forms. I know it poses a real difficulty. And I think it's it's hard to um, give a one answer catches all actually in respect to pupillage applications because sometimes when you drill down with people there is something behind that passion so you might think to yourself that it doesn't come from anywhere that's just why but I think really try and analyze yourself as to where that comes from I did a mock interview with a young woman for pupillage not long ago and she, I asked her that question and she kind of gave me the standard waffly sort of answer for quite a long time about justice, etc. and being an advocate. And right at the end, I started asking her more questions. She mentioned that an uncle had been arrested during um, a de political demonstration in Turkey. And she'd realised that he hadn't had any representation and that had actually sparked her interest as a young girl. It was like, no, 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 that, 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 that's where you go with that. So I understand why the question's being asked. If all you think you can say is, I just really do, I have a passion for it, then yeah, that's not going to read well on an application form. It doesn't substantiate why. And I think therefore you are going to have to try and really ask yourself the hard questions and explain that in a way that reads well on the form and try and then you can bring that, as you say, to the interview. But I think for many people, actually, there is something behind that passion. And if you can find that so that then you can articulate and substantiate that passion on the form, then you should lead with it. Yeah, I couldn't have put that any better. Uh, Steve's talked a bit about how you've got to give evidence and that's crucial. One thing I do think is helpful, though, is if you're trying to answer this question, make a list of all the reasons why you want to be a barrister and make a really honest list. If you think you look fabulous in a wig, write that down. If you watch some terrible TV soap opera and that inspired you, write that down. Then cross out all the things that are not impressive. <laughs> and focus on what's left, which probably will be impressive, and think exactly as Karma said about why it is that that interests you. Were you involved in a car accident as a child and did you have to go to court? Did you see the barristers there? Were you inspired by them? That is what is interesting, not how passionate you are. I hope everyone is gonna be passionate by the time they get to filling out their pupillage application form. Thank you so much. Uh, talking about evidence base in your application, uh, one student is asking that if you have the chance to work with a specific uh, barrister, is it appropriate that in your applications you make references to those uh, uh, specific barristers? Is it advisable to mention their names? I'll jump in. Yes, it's absolutely fine to make sure you spell their name correctly. The only thing I would say, I read a form recently where somebody was obviously incredibly impressed by an individual barrister and that really came through on the form and that was brilliant for that barrister's chambers. But for anyone else reading it, they would think he wants to go to this set rather than to come here. So just be careful when you're tailoring that you need to tailor even those individual examples um, if there's a, a barrister that you have name checked in particular. Yeah, I, I would name check. Um, and yeah, the caution about name spelling, absolutely. I've read so many where they've missed off QCs on QCs or added QCs randomly to people based on what row they were sat in and stuff like that, that then irritated people. I, I'm wondering whether I should give this advice or not. I think sometimes if you wax lyrical about a particular barrister, not only do people think that you might want to go there, but the bar is so bitchy <laughs> sometimes that if that person actually isn't racist particularly, then you kind of read it with a raised eyebrow. And you shouldn't because it's really hard to judge who is actually good or who isn't or who's kind of playing to the gallery. Um, so uh, be perhaps a little bit cautious about waxing their call about barristers, particularly on a form that's going to have to go if it's on uh, going to go to multiple sets. You know, just just a degree of caution about that. I hope that's not the wrong advice, and um, people don't think that you should just be glowing about everyone. Yeah, if you really want to to rave about somebody, just don't give their name. Just say, you know, I saw a junior barrister in court, and he or she did this. There's there's no harm in not mentioning that name. Yes, I would go further and I'd say, actually, you know, a bit of mystery in your uh, letter or application is can be very good. 
Um, if somebody was applying to Chambers and they had uh, something nice to say about a particular member of Chambers, that would count in your favour because it would be part of, as it were, the evidence that you're putting forward for wanting to apply to these Chambers. If the person wasn't in the Chambers, I, I'd probably need a good reason why I'd want to mention their name. I'd probably just contextualise it, as Georgina's just said, and just say, I was really inspired by this, if that's what you want to say. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we have another more practical question um, in relation to what uh, Karma said earlier um, about making a connection to a specific area, for example, if you're not applying within London. Uh, this person said, I'm from Birmingham and there's not many pupillage opportunities, so I would have to move away. How do I therefore show dedication for that area if I am nowhere near that area? Well, I think people don't expect you to show a connection to London if that's what you're talking about. If, um, you know, no, nobody expects a sort of geographical connection um, in London or even probably the South East. I think the difficulty is if you're applying to pupillage in Newcastle or, or um, you know, one of the more sort of outlying areas, then a concern if you have no connections or family um at all we don't you know it can it can be a difficult period of time of course and then we just don't want to see it so i think you perhaps have to meet it head on it's difficult to know where i mean and again if you're applying to a particular set of chambers because they have a particular interest in that they're an admiralty set but you grew up in a landlocked you know uh, part of the country then of course you're going to be able to explain that away I think you can let that be known in other ways that you're ready to commit to an area, whatever the area is, that you're, you know, in that sort of stable place that you're looking to kind of put down roots that eventually you'd be looking to buy somewhere or your family is looking to move with you, your partner's going to move to that area. You can allude or explain in an interview or on a form some ability to commit to that chambers and that area, which is all that we're looking for. You know, I'm not saying that you need to go and join the historical society of that small town beforehand or, have, you know, published a local letters, but, you know, something so that it gives that chambers a little bit of security in offering a pupillage to someone um, that they're going to hang around. So just putting, being prepared to put roots into that particular area might be enough if you don't have a connection to it. Thank you so much. Uh, another question, and this is directed to uh, Georgina Wolf. Uh, this student says um, is interested in civil law, so wants to ask, ask uh, would experience in governmental organization help in uh, the application if the area of law is uh, civil law? Absolutely, 100%. Um, and that touches on something that may have wider application too. Um, a lot of you will have all sorts of wide and varied experience and some of you might think this isn't at all relevant to a practice at the bar. I met a student recently who had worked since she was 14 in her mother's care home, her mother ran a care home, and she had the most amazing experience arising from that. And she didn't think it was relevant to being a barrister. But of course it's relevant to being a barrister because it had taught her interpersonal skills. It had taught her working under pressure. It demonstrated her work ethic. Um, she had even done some sort of licensing and regulatory work within, uh, within that work, which is of course another really valuable thing. So whatever your work experience, think about how it translates across to a career at the bar. And I bet, you know, you can, whatever it might be, whatever you've done, it will still have some sort of translation. You just need to explain on your form why it is relevant. We'll move to, I think it was Paige. Uh, Georgina said Paige had a question. Hi. I've really enjoyed this evening. Just wanted to put that at this. And um, in terms of, I suppose though, why do you want to be a barrister question on the application? Um, I've spent some time working in the solicitor's firm in both personal injury and, and now crime um, as a paralegal. So would you advise and think it's an okay, okay thing to demonstrate perhaps that you have worked alongside and done as solicitors would, but you've still, you've sort of tr not tried that, but you still feel that you don't want to be a solicitor advocate perhaps um, and go down that avenue? 
Is that a good thing to do? Because I, I think that people really overlook that and I think it's really, really important experience. And I don't have any problem with saying that, you know, I wanted to be a lawyer. I presume that was a sort of solicitor role, which a lot of people do, and they go and do that work. And then they see that there's another arm to the profession. They're exposed to that. I think it shows someone who's kind of come to it with mature reflection. Um, but perhaps more importantly, it goes back to the point that I was trying to make before about the commercial element. If you've worked for two or three firms of solicitors locally to that set of chambers and you've worked there for a long time and you've trusted and you've made good relationships with the people there, then I think you can hold yourself out as someone if you have, can have those conversations with your partners in the firm about potential briefs to follow you. And you're able to go to a set of chambers and say you've established those connections, you've seen that work from the solicitor side of the profession. I think that's invaluable experience and there's ways of presenting that on your form which allow you to meet a lot of the questions um, and it comes then when you're answering the question of why you want to be a barrister it comes from a it doesn't come from a place of ignorance it comes from a real understanding of the two limbs of the profession and I think it makes a real difference to instructing solicitors when they're dealing with people who understand their business and understand the pressures they're under and are sympathetic towards that. I, I again think it can be a really good selling point for when you're on your feet for your clerk in terms of work. So don't feel at all embarrassed or that you need to hide a change of tack or a change of career path is my view. I, I totally agree. And I think the same is true. If you did say a commercial mini pupillage and it showed you you didn't want to do commercial law. I think that's equally valid. I like to see that on a form because it shows me that somebody is informed in the choice that they're making. Yeah, we get a lot of people um, coming to Chambers who've had a career either as a solicitor and then they've wanted to swap over or they've had a career in a completely different profession, whether that be journalism or something else, um, wanted to doctors, uh, all sorts of um, people decide, you know, midway through their career that they'd like a change. That's not a disadvantage or a problem. It's not a negative. Every, almost everything, <laughs> as I think is becoming clear in the last few exchanges, almost anything can be put in a way which shows it's to your advantage rather than to your disadvantage. You just have to think of a of the right way to put it. And that's part of the skill of any advocate is to put forward something, but to put for, put it forward in a way which actually advances his client's case. And you just need to do it for yourself. Yeah, brilliant, thank you. Like I've always known I've wanted to do bar. Um, it's just that I've taken the time instead of going straight from, and sorry, from graduating, I've sort of gone into solicitor's firms to ensure that I definitely want to do that rather than a barrister and um, ex-solicitor. So thank you everyone, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we're just going to take the final live question from Gemma Lincoln. I believe uh, they had a question and then we're going to wrap up. So Gemma, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Yes, my name's Gemma. Um, so I'm 40 and a single mum to four children. And also because of that, um, one of my children is disabled. Um, and I, I spent 10 years um, taking time out to bring him up, obviously, which was a challenge as he has cerebral palsy. Um, now, I, I've still achieved a first um, and my access course was, I, I got a distinction, but I'm slightly worried because obviously I don't, I mean, I did get a scholarship from BPP for academic excellence, but with regards to prizes or work experience and things like that, I have so much less than anybody else because in my spare time I have to be mum um, and that, that has to obviously be paramount. So I'm just wondering basically is this going to go against me in my barrister's applications? And that's my question to whoever wishes I'll, to I'll answer. jump in. First of all Gemma, can I take my hat off to you? You are obviously an amazing woman. I mean that is a serious achievement. I'm, I'm just finishing maternity leave. I've got one little child and it is the hardest thing I have ever done. The Supreme Court will be nothing to you when you get there. So can I say that to begin with? Um, make sure that you put down all of that on your form so that we know and we can assess you fairly. Um, don't be too disheartened. You should, you know, those, those are very, very valid extenuating circumstances that you have. One thing I would say is make sure you do do mini pupillages 
doesn't matter about all of the you know mooting competitions and things like that but mini pupillages you need to make sure you've done at least one and if you are offered mini pupillages ask if you can do shortened ones so if you can do just two days rather than a full week because again chambers should allow for caring responsibilities so that you can do more you can sort of squeeze more into your time um it, it's it is definitely going to be hard for you but i think you've done absolutely amazingly to get where you've got so far and i think that will stand you in really really good stead um and i just want to say the very best of luck can i just end with one top tip for everybody put your best points first this applies for your entire career when you're um, standing up next to Gemma in the Supreme Court. Make sure you put your best points first, but do it on your form as well. Um, and very finally, please apply for the Fox Scholarship when applications open. It's the only, I think, the only international scholarship the Middle Temple is running next year. And you get to go to Canada for 10 months, I think it's six or 10 months. Um, and it's a fantastic opportunity. So just a plug for that. Thank you. Uh, can I just add, uh, Gemma, you only have to say what you said and I would have imagined you'll get an interview. So it's, 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 I don't, I don't agree with Georgia, Georgina, these are extenuating circumstances. I think this is exactly the kind of thing that Chambers wants to hear, namely that someone has achieved what you've achieved despite the odds in the way that you've done it. I mean, that's exactly what we're looking for. It shows someone is determined, someone knows how to get something. And that's, if, if you don't have those things, then you won't succeed at the bar. Excellent. I, I, I would definitely echo that and to just wish Gemma and in, indeed all of you the, the very best of luck um, with all your applications. And, and just remember, there are people out there who are willing to help and we'll try and help in any way that we can with what we all understand and appreciate is a very difficult process because we've all been through it ourselves. So. Don't ever hesitate to reach out to people. Um, we're all here and willing to help in any way that we can. Tamar, did you want to come in? Yeah, I completely echo that. And I think you've heard from our stories that I don't think there's one of us that hasn't had setbacks along the way or thought that it's going to be, um, you know, had times where we've questioned whether it's right for us or other people have got those applications or scholarships ahead of us. But... We haven't given up. <laughs> We're still here. Um, so I'm going to have to go. So I shall take my opportunity to say cheerio. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, that brings us to the end of the evening anyway. So I know we've run uh, just 10 minutes over time, but thank you so much to our amazing panel who have given up their time this evening. You know, you have so much going on. So Thank you for your great insight and just being really transparent with us um, and very practical um, in the tips that you've given. Um, I think they've been really useful to everybody who's been able to attend. So definitely to all the people that have um, joined us tonight, make sure you apply the advice um, and best of luck as we push on with the rest of, I think we've got a couple more days left of pupillage applications. So um, keep going and make sure you connect with the barristers as well that have taken part in the panel. They all seem really open to hearing from us and um, giving further advice and so make sure you connect with them online as well. Um, so that brings our evening to an end. And yes, thank you everyone for joining and have an amazing evening. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you everyone.